We'll carry on from where we were last week. So we were in Acts chapter 8. And we um, looked at the first few verses. And um, we can go over the rest of that chapter, really. Well, so the rest of that chapter, I mean, from verse um, 9 up to verse 25. It concerns one story. Because, you know, the next one we go on to that is the um, Ethiopian who's baptised. But we'll just deal with this little section tonight. It's not a, there's a lot of verses, but there's not a huge amount there really to think about it and it's you know like last week we were dealing with a subject that you could keep talking and talking about it mm -hmm. but um i just want us to look at this one and you know verses uh, it's one. Uh, uh, chapter eight and we'll start re reading from or looking at verse nine now it's we're talking here about um a sorcerer's profession of faith and we think well that's sort of like um a bit strange it's almost like histories that we talk about witches and sorcerers and people like that we sort of think they're all consigned to the past and it's all magic and Harry Potter or something like that, you know. But the thing is, I was um, I looked up on um, the internet and they didn't have the latest figures, but in the 2001 census, people, you, you could put down what your religion was in 2001. I think you can do it anyhow now. But in 2001, and I, I use the term religion a little bit loosely here, because this was inclu including people who class themselves as pagan or wicca, Druids and heathen, witches, occult, um, shamanism, and all the rest of them. They, they said in, in Britain that there was 85,435 people who classed themselves who would write that down on the census as, you know, that kind of thing, you know, which is, you know, when you think they're getting involved with things that we would consider to be a little bit on the borderline, to say the least of it, that's quite a lot, really. Um, if you spread them around the country, you know, it means there's one near you kind of thing, really. Um, but I know for a fact that in the last 20 years, the figures have gone up quite a lot, really. Um, and um, you may know somebody who classes themselves as a witch yourself. You know, you know I mean, um, that's not, like, you know, not, not that rare nowadays. Mm. Well, and I'll tell you what, Patty, Patty has a lady who comes around from time to time, she does sort of like your nails and bits mm. and pieces like that. And she just said to Patty the other day, she said, I'm a witch, didn't she? I am a witch. I'm a witch. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, I won't expect them to get that. Because too. now she is more with the spells, candles, to healing with candles and crystals. And, oh my God. So, I don't want this lady anymore in my house. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, no. the thing is, it's not so rare anymore, okay? No. And um, it says that there's more than 2 million people using the witches of Instagram as a hashtag now, right? Two million. I mean, I don't know if that's world, probably worldwide, but that's a lot of people, isn't it? Um, so, and I, I know you go to different cities and there's shops that sell, you know, just there, they sell everything that you need to make spells or cast spells and potions. And I know generally speaking, they'll say we do it for good and not for harm, but we don't know what where it goes, do we, you know? But, um, and they actually say that 90% of their customers are women between the ages of 18 and 30. I'm <laughs> looking <laughs> at you, no? Where's your boomstick? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I, I suppose a lot of us would say we read that book by Doreen Irvin, yeah. Witchcraft yeah. the Christ, and, you know, sort of you're quite bamboozled by some of the things that she claims and says in there, you know. Um, but we're, we're not, you know, that's not something we've never heard of, is it, really? Um, and we all have to be aware that, you know, there's various forms of, wait, what you want to call it, sorcery is what we're dealing with here, or, you know, dealing with these occult things. It's, it's happening all around us, really, and the Bible says that we deal with these powers, you know, our, mm. our battles, not with what we sort of see as tangible, it's the unseen forces. So we know that it must be about, you know, and, and these witches or these people, they don't walk around with a pointy hat with <laughs> stars and moons on it, so we say, oh, there's one there or one there, you know, it's not like that, is it really? Um, but what we have to be, or remind ourselves of and be aware of is the fact that they are involved with things that are, you know, dangerous. And um, I think probably, you know, that some of them are involved in being anti-church as well. I think, you know, I think some Christians will tell you they've come up to the confrontations of, you know, these sort of situations with people who are dealing with these things. So <laughs> sorcery and all that stuff is not a thing of the past. It's something that we're dealing with, in, I think, in our lives today. But um, we're going to look at these verses here, and, and this was 2,000-ish years ago. 
So I just want to look at verse nine and it says there, but there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great. Okay, so we've got this chap here who was a sorcerer. We don't, we're not told exactly what he did, but he obviously did things that caught people's attention and probably mystified them. And up to a point held them in some kind of fear, I suppose, that he, he was able to do things that were out of the norm. And uh, therefore they were a little bit, you could say, spellbound by him, couldn't you, really? Um, uh, and they, uh, he had the esteem of the people, it tells us, really. People, you know, regarded him as someone great, okay? Um, it says there in verse 9 that he was claiming that he was someone great. He, he used it, all what he was doing to make to elevate himself and to make himself look a little bit special. Verses 10 and 11 says, you know, he, he claimed he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed. In other words, they all took notice of him, notice of him from the least to the great, to saying, this man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. So he could claim that he was somebody special because he'd done these wonderful signs and acts and wonders. And, and obviously, you know, you would, maybe in those days, I don't know, you were probably a little bit fearful of people like that. And, and I, I think today, you know, if I came across somebody who could do things that were um, a little bit out of the ordinary, I'd have a little bit of a, well, where are you getting these powers from? You know, it's not it's not normal for us to come across people who could do things like that. And we would probably be a little bit of, you know, step back. I would, you know, as a, as a Christian, I would step back. But it seems that everyone was paying attention to his claims. And, it, and he was claiming that he was, you know, the great power of God. Well, the great power of God in many ways is either the Holy Spirit or the Lord Jesus, isn't it? You know, when Jesus was on earth, he was, the great power was working through him. But now he's left... Uh, the worldly scene is in physical sense. He said, I leave you with, a, with the power of the Holy Spirit to do the things that he wants us to do. And we've seen a lot of that in Acts. But this man was basically claiming, I am the power of God. You know, I'm, in a way, God's representation on earth. And that's a huge claim to make, isn't it? To say that, you know, you are, you, you are the power of God. And this, obviously, from what we read, has been going on for a long time. Okay? But when we get to verses 12 and 13, look, but when they, this is the people, but when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized, okay? So things are starting to change here now. Um, Simon the sorcerer had, had everybody sort of taken notice of him, but now the gospel is being preached and people are starting to listen to that. And not only that, we can uh, well understand that there was other signs and wonders being formed by um, these uh, apostles, and that was catching the attention of the people as well. Um, and verse 13 says, Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptised, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs that were done. Okay? So he, he saw what was happening. And I would have thought that what he actually saw, the signs he was seeing performed by the apostles, were greater than his. So the person who'd amazed everybody was now being amazed himself, and that that really was a transformation for him, a transformation for himself, right? You know, verse one we see he he claims he's someone great, but what's the group? That, can you see there's a big difference between what Simon was doing with his sorcery and his power, and and what's happening with um, so, with so, uh, Philip? And what was Philip saying? Can you see there's a big difference between the two things that are claimed here? You know, Simon says I'm somebody great, but the apostles are coming along and they're preaching something different, or the or Philip is preaching something different. Do you know what he's the difference is he's not claiming through his signs that he is someone important, okay? He's actually using the signs, but he's proclaiming the Lord Jesus. So one is doing signs, but making himself look good. And, and Philip is doing signs, but he's actually doing it to the glory of the Lord Jesus. So it's something completely different. Um, and, you know, he, and Simon is amazed. So he, he becomes, it says, a believer and is baptised. And he continues with Philip because... Of the, of the signs that he sees, okay? And, you know, the, the, he must have been totally, totally impressed, right? Now, he believed, Simon believed, because of what he saw, okay? He saw the signs and he believed. And people always say that seeing is believing, okay? Well, there's a common thing, I know. you see it, you believe it, okay? Is seeing signs enough and believing the signs, is that enough to make you a Christian? 
if you if you were a, an eighteen and somebody performed a sign and somebody was healed, could have walked out their wheelchair and you were a, you weren't a Christian but you got on maybe with a Christian friend and you saw that and you completely believed that sign. And said, yes, God has healed that person. Is that enough to make you a Christian? Uh, is it enough to make you believe in the God, but not necessarily enough to make you a Christian. You can do that in a trust in Jesus into your heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's another further step, I would say. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, you, 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 you can believe that God has healed that person, you can see yeah. the evidence there, you've got no doubts whatsoever, but it's not the same as believing in your heart mm -hmm. that Jesus died for you, is it? You've yeah. got to believe that God is there and God has done this. And this is where a lot, uh, I, I'll put this in my notes a little bit later on, but a lot of people say, I believe in God. But it doesn't make you Christian, does it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can believe in God, but not be a Christian. So although seeing is believing, you know, it's not always, you know, you can be conv convinced of the authenticity of the healing, that's what Nick is really saying, but it doesn't make you a, a person who's accepted the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart. Mm -hmm. you, you believe, you've seen it, and you've seen it there. Um, and, you know, I think if we'd have been here at the time and Simon was there and he said, I, I, I believe what, the, uh, uh, what Philip has preached and I want to be baptised, we would probably all be saying, great, he's a Christian, and believed that he was. Because to all outward appearances, he would have been. Yeah. But something inside is not right. Um, and I, so I would say that probably all of us know people who have come to church and have been baptised, and but suddenly we don't see them anymore. You know, they've just disappeared off the off the church scene altogether. Because, in many ways, they've been caught up. They've believed in their heart that it's all real, but that they've never really totally accepted it. I don't know quite how to explain it. You know, they, they believe what the gospel says, but they don't accept it and take it on board as a, a personal message for them. And they're it's sort of like they've not quite step completely over the line you know it's like in football the ball's got to be over the line isn't it it can it can be almost completely over the line but it's got to be over the line kind of thing and um i think it can be like that with people and i i, I had a couple of um, young friends who i thought were christians and i i well, know they've gone you know they're, they're just not they're not there anymore so seeing and, and believing in your authenticity is not the same as actually accepting and asking the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart, I don't think. And, and this is what was, it seems to be Simon's problem, okay? You know, there is a, I'll put it, there is a faith or a believing that does not um, save people, okay? You can have a kind of believing that it doesn't save people. And that is uh, what's happened to many people. And a lot of people, as I say, they'll say, I believe in God, I believe the Bible's true, but you've actually got to make that commitment to it. Uh, and that's the big step that some people sort of fail at. Uh, and, and the problem is, as we read through this passage, Luke doesn't really make a difference between the people who believe and the people who profess to believe. Do you know what I mean? You, you read it and it just says, and Simon himself also believed. But he doesn't believe fully. He doesn't believe fully. But as Luke writes this, this I suppose at the time this was sort of a new thing and Maybe the church wasn't experienced things that we do today because you, if you actually, in the uh, New Testament early church days, if you believed and you stepped there, you put yourself outside of you know the society really of uh, Judaism and all those sort of things. It was a big commitment. Whereas for us today, it's not quite the same sort of thing. But so if somebody said in, in the early church, I believe, you know that it was basically genuine. But we've got a case here of a person who was a Samaritan. Okay, it's, it's a little bit different, right? Because if we just look down to verse 21, just jump to verse 21, this is what um, Peter actually says to him later on. Look, he says, you have no uh, portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. And that's what, that was the trouble with Simon. Although he believed he was, he was baptised, his heart really was not in it. He, he got an ulterior motive. There's something more for him. You know, you have no part because your heart is not right in the sight of God. And that's quite a terrible thing for somebody to say to a, a person who says they are a Christian. So I think that's, you know, when you look at that, your heart is not right with God. We can see why some people do drop off as Christians as they go along the way, you know. But um, what had actually happened? What had actually happened to, for uh, Peter to say that to Simon? Verses 14 to 17, right? I'll read them down there. It says, now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria 
had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had not uh, fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. Something new had happened in Samaria. Okay, These are Gentiles, really. They're not classed as... They didn't, the Jews didn't look upon the Samaritans as proper Jews. They're, they're outside of the kingdom. You know, they were a separate entity in many ways, right? But they hear in Jerusalem that the Samaritans are being saved and they're being baptised, they're becoming believers. So when the apostles hear about it, they said, well, we've got to send two reliable people down there to investigate. And so they send down Peter and John. Now, I don't know if you remember the story, but there's a... There's an, uh, an account in the Gospels where I think it is John and one of the other disciples because the Samaritans wouldn't believe they wouldn't accept the Lord Jesus. They said to Jesus, shall we call down fire upon these Samaritans? Okay, And it's quite strange that it's John who actually comes up to investigate what's happening with these Samaritans. And when they get down, get down there, they get down to Samaria and they look around, they discover that these people haven't received the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know how they discovered that. <laughs> The Bible doesn't tell us, and, and we could, we'd have to form our own um, impression of that. I don't know what I don't know what you've got, whether you've got any thoughts on that. But it said they'd only been named uh, baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When we baptize somebody, we say, "I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit." Don't we? We, we go through the the three parts when we're baptized. But maybe they just said, "I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus." I don't know. But it's what it seems to indicate as you read the text. Um, I don't know if anybody's got any thoughts on that, whether, what, how you see that, but that's the only way I can understand that they, they're just being baptised into the name of Jesus and um, not into, into the Holy Spirit as well. Um, the Bible doesn't tell us either what evidence there is of them receiving the, the Holy Spirit as well, because look, it says, verse 17, then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Well, we don't know what happened. We don't know what actually went on but they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, this is sort of a, a controversial area with Christians, really. Um, we believe, and I think it's true, that we can say the moment we're saved, the Holy Spirit comes into us. Um, because I don't, the Bible, Bible says quite clearly, without the Holy Spirit, you can't profess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that you need that. But then this is this other area where Many Christians will say, well, but there's a second part of being baptised in the Holy Spirit as well, and you end up, most people say you end up speaking in tongues. I don't know why they always say you end up speaking in tongues, because that's not what the Bible says at all. But Paul says, um, in, I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, do all speak in tongues? No, they don't. Um, because you could be, well, be completely immersed in the Holy Spirit, never speak in tongues, but do other things, you know. So, so we can't just say that that's the only sign that... Uh, somebody's a spirit-filled person, that they're, they're speaking in tongues, that's not right. Um, and, and we know that in, as you go through the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, tongues is almost at the, one of the last things you come to, you know. So being what we are, people, we tend to make our own conclusions and say what we think is right, but it's not necessarily what the Bible says. We don't really know exactly what happened, uh, how they received the Holy Spirit, but I do believe that the church in many ways, or a lot of the churches, um, use this as a pattern. Because if you go through uh, the way things work, you, you can be baptised first as a baby, okay? Um, you could be confirmed in that belief when you get older. And then you receive the laying on of hands to receive the Holy Spirit. You know, that, that comes along the three steps. The church tends to follow that kind of pattern in a way, you know. Um, I think the Catholics are that way, don't they? Mm -hmm. And I know the, the Orthodox, because I spoke to a chap about that as well. Um, you know, so it, you're, you're, you're baptised, you're confirmed in your faith, and you, the, the bishop or somebody would lay hands on you to receive the Holy Spirit. And in a nutshell, that's what they've got there. But I, I believe as well that the moment you, you are saved, you receive the Holy Spirit. And I think we could sort of debate around that all night, how it works exactly, and everybody's going to have slightly different ideas, you know. Um, and I, I personally think that, um, you know, there comes a time in people's lives where they can receive a, a boost to what they believe. And I don't know how's the best way to describe it, I don't want to be contentious, but sometimes things happen in life that really give you a boost. And it's like a confirmation, if you want, that you're on the right track, you know. And things happen to us in life all the while. 
as, as Christians that that can happen, you know. So I think that, you know, we can see that, the, you know, Peter and John come down and, and, and they, they lay their hands up, they receive the Holy Spirit. And I don't think we can surmise any more than that because we haven't got any more information. We can make up and add and that, but the, the Bible is there. That's just what it tells us. So we don't know what happened. I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that, because often people do have thoughts in that area. Um, what you'd like to say to that, but, um, you know, the Bible doesn't actually give us any evidence of what really happened there. But we know they received the Holy Spirit. And, and as we've been saying week by week, that as we go through Acts, we see the necessity of the Holy Spirit working in people, you know, for the work of the church to progress. And um, sometimes we can be a bit hesitant ourselves about asking God to fill us with the Holy Spirit because we don't know what it's going to lead us to, do you know what I mean? Um, we, we think, well, if, we, if I get full of the Holy Spirit, what am I going to do? Am I going to go around, around Stone Market shouting my mouth off or you know, is it going to cause me to do this or what, what am I going to do? You know, so we, we can be a bit hesitant. But at, at the same time, we know that when people were full of the Holy Spirit, they were full of joy. So I don't think we have to be fearful about that. But we do need us to be, I think, effective Christians. We do need our, uh, to ask God. I suppose we should do it on a daily basis, to fill us with the Spirit on a daily basis. Uh, and we don't know how God's going to answer that on a day-to-day -day basis either, do we? You know, we might end up dancing around. We may end up, you know, just being able to speak out more to, to people that we meet or having the words to speak to people when we meet them. But if we ask God to give us his Spirit, I'm sure that he will do that. You know, it's not like he's going to say, oh, no, not for you today. That's not for you. No, or you, you haven't earned it or you're not worthy of it. As Christians, we're told that that's a gift that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to give to all of us. It's for all of us. And it's, it's for the glory of God, not for the glory of us. So there's no harm in day by day praying that the Lord will fill us with his spirit, give us more of his spirit. Uh, and, and it seems to me that this is what happened here, that they, they received the spirit and it was a great encouragement for each one of them. Um, I think it's Acts 2 verse 38. This, this is something I was talking about there. Acts 2 verse 38 actually says, doesn't it? Um, then Peter said to them, Look, repent. Let every one of you be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the Holy Spirit, okay? So if these Christians had actually repented, they had received the Lord Jesus Christ and been baptised, in theory, according to that verse, they should have already received the Holy Spirit. So whether it was the fact that um, they weren't, I don't know, exhibiting gifts of the Spirit, I don't know. Maybe at that point they haven't had that teaching so mm -hmm. they weren't expecting anything and therefore because they weren't expecting anything they didn't receive anything yeah and, and they weren't doing maybe what they were already capable of doing because they never expected to do it yeah and and not only that that could apply to us as well you know yeah. we, we can withhold you know i think sometimes you know sometimes we feel that we should be doing something you know we, we should speak to someone or we i don't know it could just be that you should raise your hands in worship to god you know and you don't. We don't let ourselves go, do you know what I mean? In 15, it says, when they arrived, they were the new believers, that, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So yeah. it's quite possible that when people go to a, come to a church service and for the first time, and then suddenly kind of believe what they're hearing and want to accept it, but it, it's a different thing yourself then coming forward to say, I want this, I want to yeah, accept the yeah. Holy Spirit in my life, isn't it? Yeah, that, perhaps that's what they were doing in... That, that's a good point, because that could be where Simon was at. He, he'd sort of believed and he was baptised, but he hadn't quite opened his, his heart up enough to, you know, or maybe they were all in a similar position, I don't know, but they hadn't actually received the Holy Spirit to help them to get their heart quite right with the Lord. We don't know, do we? Because unless they were true, they wouldn't receive the Holy Spirit. No. And that's why it says they might receive the Holy Spirit. Yeah, Assuming yeah. That, some, but they may not receive the Holy yeah, Spirit. Yeah, uh, obviously it seems a bit like Simon didn't, because mm -hmm. when you get down to verse 21, Peter has a right go at him, you know. Yeah. <laughs> or, or even before that, you know. Um, I, I'll read those verses, 18 to 24, we'll look at them. Um, well, verse 17, they, then they laid their hands on and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying of the apostles' hands, uh, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. Now, Possibly when he went, he saw a visible sign, you know, and he thought, "Wow, this is something special." And he says to them, um, 
give me this power, all right? Also, that anyone on whom I lay my hands might receive the Holy Spirit, okay? He wanted to buy it, right? He offered the money, look, in verse 18. But Peter said to him, your money perished with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Mm. Repent, therefore, uh, of your wickedness and pray, uh, and, or ask God if perhaps the, the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. It didn't mean to say that he couldn't get right with God and become a Christian and receive the Holy Spirit. He could have done that. But he says, for I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and banned by iniquity. Obviously, Simon has got this desire. He wants the power. He's been a sorcerer. And he's still got this desire to have supernatural powers, hasn't he? For his glory, I know for yeah. God's glory. Yeah, and he, he's prepared yeah. to buy it. Okay, yeah. he's prepared yeah. to pay for it because, yeah, because he, he doesn't want to lose for his. his name. He doesn't yeah. want to lose his position. Yeah, yeah, it is for his glory. It's, and um, he actually says that in verse twenty-four: um, "Pray for the Lord for me that none of the things that you have spoken may come upon me." Okay, and, and he doesn't actually repent. He doesn't say sorry, does he? You know, what he's actually done, this is, this is the first instance we, re we, we, we read of somebody trying to commercialise the gospel. There's a lot of it going on today, yeah. but he, there he is. This yeah. is the first instance of somebody thinking, well, I buy it for money and I can probably go out and I can use this for money. You know, I can mm -hmm. perform signs and wonders and probably charge people to come along and, and see it, which is what people do today. Mm. You know, people make a lot of money doing that today. And so Simon was the forerunner of a lot of that, really. Um, but he wasn't concerned about receiving God's pardon. That, was, that wasn't his main priority. What he was worried about, he was just worried about avoiding judgment, okay? And sometimes I think that's another thing that we have to be a bit careful about, that people are so afraid of the judgment that they become Christians, but they become Christians because they don't want to be judged by God, but they still haven't got that... There's a whole package when we become Christians. There's a, there's a time of sort of saying sorry to God for the way we are, which we call repentance, isn't it? You know? But we need to be you know, aware of it. It's more than just a one little part of becoming a Christian. I think uh, our hearts open up to quite a few things. You know, God deals with us in a lot of ways. It's not just repentance. We're aware that we've been um, saved from judgment, which is a, a, a feeling of gratitude, isn't it, as well, you know? Uh, and we're given a greater hope. We know that we've got a glorious future in front of us. We're transformed from darkness into light, and from death into life. There's a lot of things that happen the moment you're saved, isn't there? And, and just avoiding judgment is one part of that, isn't it? And maybe his main concern was, I want to be able to perform these signs and wonders, and I don't want to be judged for it. So <laughs> his heart's not completely right with God, and that's probably what Peter had to deal with him in, in, with such hard, harsh words. But you know, it makes us think as well. You know that you know we have to we have to consider our whole being, don't we? You know, when we come to God in prayer, there's a lot of aspects to think about, really, uh, and you know, to thank God for that we can deal with it. Verse twenty five just says, "So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans." And so we can see that, that, that you know that was a, that one of the first little missionary trips just outside of Jerusalem, really, to the Samaritans. But there's a lot of things for us to think about there because you know we need to keep, make sure our hearts are right, and we need you know to be able to explain these things to people if they ask questions to us, don't we? You know, it's not, and I don't think they're easy things to sort of explain. You know what, what happens, and that's one of the things we need to pray about as well because they're supernatural things, aren't they? And um, Although we've got the Holy Spirit, we're not supernatural beings. <laughs> you know, we, we, we tend to still understand things in our mortal terms, don't we? You know the way we see things. But there is a, a lot to pray about and to and to think about and, uh, and and to read about. And I think as we go through Acts, we should start to understand a little bit more of it and learn a little bit more of that. So, so it's a little bit something else to think about, isn't it?